Good afternoon. My name is Tom Nastic, and I'm a public uh, program producer here at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are here in the William G. McGowan Theater, as well as those watching us on our YouTube channel. Today, our series of noontime author lectures continues with Countdown to Pearl Harbor from Infamy to Greatness with our special guest, Craig Nelson. This is one of two programs we are presenting today in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, which occurred on December 7, 1941, and plunged the United States into the Second World War. After Mr. Nelson's lecture and book signing, which takes place, uh, the book signing takes place outside in the theater lobby, he will return to the theater at 2 p.m. to introduce a selection of archival radio broadcasts, newsreels, and images that illustrate how the media first informed and kept Americans apprised of the events of December 7th and their aftermath. I also want to call your attention to a featured document display currently uh, in the East Rotunda Gallery, which is two floors up from this theater. Uh, there through January 4th, we have on display the U.S. Senate's copy of President Roosevelt's famous Day of Infamy speech, asking a joint resolution of Congress for a declaration of war in response to the Japanese attack. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online at archives.gov. There are also copies in the lobby along with a sign-up sheet so you can receive it by regular mail or email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. In addition to today's book, historian and author Craig Nelson is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Rocket Men as well as several previous books, books, including The Age of Radiance, a Penn Award finalist, The First Heroes, Thomas Paine, which was a winner of the Henry Adams Prize, and Let's Get Lost, uh, shortlisted for W.H. Smith's Book of the Year. His writing has appeared in Vanity Fair, The Wall Street Journal, Salon, National Geographic, The New England Review, Popular Science, California Quarterly, Blender, Semiotext, Reader's Digest, and a host of other publications. He is a graduate of the University of Texas, Austin, with a Bachelor of Science in the Humanities. He also attended the USC Film School, the US UCLA Writing Program, and the Harvard Radcliffe Publishing Course. He turned to writing full-time in 2002. As I said after his talk and audience Q&A, uh, Craig will be signing copies of his book outside in the McGowan Theater lobby. Would you please welcome Craig Nelson to the National Archives. So, of course, like any historian, I'm thrilled to be doing this today with the archives. I think I see some civilians in the audience, so let me explain. Uh, when I was on a panel of Pearl Harbor historians a couple of days ago for three hours on C-SPAN, we got asked, what do you like about your job? And we said, research. And where do we do research? In archives. In fact, one of the great moments of my life in doing this book was when I walked into the Center for Legislative Archives, which is the back door here, and walked in and I said, <clears throat> so I need the documents for the nine federal investigations of Pearl Harbor. And they wheel out this enormous thing. It's, it was about, let's see, it's 48 feet long. So it's eight of me arranged in tier like a wedding cake. And it's like, surprise, here you go. And it's sort of horrifying. And then I found out that the uh, Japanese archive for this is 103 volumes. So just taking on something like Pearl Harbor is a sort of daunting test of research. But I hired almost a dozen people to work in New York and Washington and Honolulu and Tokyo to do this, to give you a definitive book uh, equivalent to At Dawn We Slept. So I'm hoping to upgrade. So if you love Japanese military history, you'll love At Dawn We Slept. And if you're interested in anything else, you'll like my book. So uh, what happened, though, is that uh, at this point, 15 months ago, this book was uh, a million pages of raw documents. And those million pages are still rolling around in my head. So originally, I tried doing a presentation for you that was an overview of all of Pearl Harbor, but I failed because of those million pages. So instead, I'm just going to do highlights. And if there's something about it that I don't cover, please ask about it in the Q&A, OK? So let's begin with this famous picture. I'm sure many of you already know. This is the USS Shaw exploding in dry dock. And the reason we want it for the cover, besides the fact that it's an incredible picture, is that the exact same thing that happens here is what is going to happen to the Arizona, in that 
a bomb dropped from 11,000 feet is penetrating next to a turret and penetrating through the armored decks of the ship and striking a powder magazine and turning the ship itself into a bomb. So we don't have a good picture of the Arizona in its death throes when it breaks its back and becomes one of the few uh, ships that's unsalvageable. But we do have this picture, and that's why we start with that. So I want to know if anyone can recognize who this man holding the child's hand is. Does he look familiar? Yeah. So this is our first fantastic find in doing this book. And this is where I date the start. Well, I date the start of this story to Commodore Perry. But let's not go back that far in time. I date the start of this story to 1914. It's two months before Archduke Ferdinand is assassinated. And it is seven years before Franklin Roosevelt comes down with polio and is paralyzed. And he's at the Brooklyn Navy Yard overseeing the laying of the keel of ship number, I think, 38, which is then christened the USS Arizona. And the reason why we love finding this picture so much is because <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt loved the United States Navy more than he loved any simple human being. He had such a passion for the Navy, and this is, you can see his passion right here. He's so thrilled to be at this ceremony. This is the Wilson administration. And when he's president, he will raise the Navy's budget every year during the heart of the Depression. He will uh, take his breakfast meetings wearing his beautiful blue Navy cloak surrounded by his naval memorabilia. He will only allow his coded magic documents to be delivered by the Navy, never by the Army. And he will call the Navy us and the Army them until General Marshall makes him cut that out. <laughs> so you can just see the birth of Franklin Roosevelt's love of the Navy and the whole birth of Pearl Harbor right here. I think there's something more dramatic than Pearl Harbor happening right here. OK, so if, if Pearl Harbor begins for America in 1914, it begins for the Japanese in 1931 with the invasion of Manchuria. Now, one of the great difficulties that uh, US and Japan had in their relationship was that the United States became convinced that the Japanese were just like the Nazis, that they were this unified force of fascist bent on global uh, domination that could not be negotiated with, that would, uh, would go back on any of its agreements, that was completely untrustworthy. So we didn't really even try to negotiate with them. And this was a mistake, because actually what we now found out is that the Japanese government was a complete sense of chaos. During the 14 years of the Great East Asia War, the government changed hands 15 times. That there was a group of people. Uh, uh, who had taken control of the government by assassinating civilian leaders, and that this group was the one who merged them into fascism and into taking over. Now, at this point, the Chinese are very good friends of ours, and they're a great ally. And in fact, when Americans are polled, who's more important to the fight against fascism, the British or the Chinese? Twice as many Americans picked the Chinese in the 1930s. Uh, so they, the American public was very upset about the war crimes they were hearing about going on over there. But they weren't so upset that they wanted to raise the army and send them out. So uh, what we tried to do was an economic embargo of petroleum. And in a minute, we'll find out how that turned out. Uh, so the, of those uh, 15 different prime ministers that took the reins of Japan during this period, the most important one was the last civilian prime minister from Omar Konoye. And Prince Konoye was a fantastic background. He comes from one of the royal families from which all the concubines that Japan used to give birth to emperors came from. And so he's literally the social equal of Roosevelt, who, remember, thought the Vanderbilts were Arabes. So uh, Konoye uh, really, really hoped to settle a peace treaty with Roosevelt. And Joseph Gu, our ambassador to Japan, was convinced this was going to work. They were going to meet on a battleship off the coast of Alaska uh, and settle their differences and be blessed by the emperor. And Pearl Harbor would have never happened. But the more uh, hawkish members of the Roosevelt administration insisted that this was a ploy for time and that it didn't mean anything and you couldn't take it seriously. So it was canceled. And he was replaced by Tojo. But my favorite thing about Kanoya is how he liked to eat. 
all right? If you want to know how royalty in Japan eats, it's a fantastic example. He would go to a party or a restaurant, and he would point out the raw fish he wanted. And a geisha following him, carrying a pair of chopsticks and a bowl of boiling water, would pick out the fish and swirl it in the water and then put it in his mouth. So I hope that some of you get to eat that way at some point in the future. Um, <clears throat> so Konoye was replaced. Our last chance at peace was replaced by uh, the worst, uh, one of the worst villains of World War II, Hideki Tojo. And Tojo not only ran the Kwantung Army, which was the one responsible for the war crimes in China, he also ran the Kempetai, the secret police. And he authored the field medal, manual that said, whatever you do, don't but not be taken prisoner of war. So that turned the Pacific Theater into an especially gruesome battleground, and he's responsible for that. But there is a happy ending somewhat to this story. When he was captured in 1945, uh, he needed new dentures. So an American dentist made him some dentures, and he had Remember Pearl Harbor inscribed in Morse code on the dentures. Now, one of the mystifying characters in this story is the show, what the Japanese call the Showa Emperor, and we call by his uh, name Hirohito. And the reason that Hirohito is so interesting is that you see him tentatively, over and over again, try and stop the rush to war. And he does so, he tries quoting his grandfather Meiji, is a greatly revered figure in Japan. He tries quoting Meiji to the generals, and that doesn't work. He tries various things to stop it. And when he's taken, uh, when he meets MacArthur, during the pacification program, he's asked, why didn't he do more? And he said, if I had, there would have been a coup d'etat, and I would have been imprisoned in an asylum or assassinated. So this was the kind of thing we just didn't understand at the time. But uh, for all of Hirohito's failings, he was able to hold on to his throne. Now, at the beginning of 1941, the uh, Japanese put forth a plan they already own sort of most of the northern part of this. Korea is their colony, and they've invaded most of this northern section of China. And they develop a plan to take over all the rest of it. And it's called Operation Number One. And from November 41 to uh, uh, March 42, they succeed in doing this. It's one of the greatest military campaigns of all time. They take over everything of Southeast Asia to uh, the border of what is, was now Pakistan uh, uh, to, to Siberia, and this enormous amount of territory. It's, it's just gigantic. And the one thing that they think is standing in their way is the American fleet based here in Hawaii. Um, and so in Japanese history, the Pearl Harbor is merely a protecting of the flank uh, to this great takeover that they achieve. And, but one guy, Mr. Ya, uh, uh, Isoroku Yamamoto, has a very clear idea of what he thinks should happen, even though he does it in a strange way. Now, Yamamoto is the most written about Japanese man in American history because he's so puzzling. He had spent many years in the United States. He loved America passionately. His great hero was Abraham Lincoln, and he taught himself English by reading Lincoln biographies. Uh, uh, and he would preach to his countrymen again and again and again across the 1930s, you cannot win a war with America. You don't even plan on doing it. It will not work out. You can't win. You can't win. To such an extent that his own superiors feared for his assassination and had him reassigned to live on a battleship so he couldn't be ca captured and killed. But at the same time that he was doing, you'll never win a war, he said, if you do go to war, you've got to wipe out Hawaii because that will make the American will to fight collapse. Uh, and we know how well that worked out. So I'm always surprised that someone who knew America so well would imagine that uh, if, we, if the Japanese killed 2,000 Americans in Hawaii, we would go, oh, OK, we're not do, doing anything. You go ahead and take over Asia, because that's so un-American to me. So, but you have across the 1930s, uh, starting, at, sorry, starting in 1940, the beginning of 41, Yamamoto is constantly saying, we need to attack Hawaii and decimate them, but don't go to war with America. And he's known as the reluctant admiral because of that. So on the American side, uh, 
the, the sort of general idea of the time can be summed up with Henry Stimson. He was the Secretary of War. And he said that he knew the Asiatic mind. And the only way you could deal with Japan was to treat her rough, which is uh, an odd thing uh, to me. But anyway, that sort of sums up what everyone felt at this time and how they were so blind to let this happen. Uh, one of the great quotes is um, Commander Flood of one of the airfields said, I can't believe those ye little yellow bastards did this to us when everyone knows America is superior to Japan. Uh, so that was sort of the thinking of the time. But if any of you are interested in American history, if you have not read Stimson's diaries, they are, you must put them on your must-read list. They are fantastic. So under Stimson is General George Marshall. Well, not quite under, but sort of to the side is General George Marshall. And one of the great things in this story is to see how General Marshall starts off not doing so good at his job and then becoming an icon. So you're going to read about how, you're going to learn about how um, in, a, in the middle of November of 1941, Marshall calls a press conference. And it's a secret press conference. It's supposed to be off the record. And he's going to get the press ready for war that's coming. And he tells them that the first week of December is a dangerous period. But after that, we're going to be in the clear because we're going to have B-17s that are going to take off in the Philippines and bomb the home islands of Japan and come back to the Philippines. And someone says, but wait a minute. According to your specs, a B-17 can't get from the Philippines to Japan and back. And they don't really answer that question. So the New York Times publishes an article called, This is a War We Could Lose. So that's where Marshall is at the start of the story. At the end, of course, he becomes the first professional soldier to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, heading up the Navy was Harold Stark. And uh, Admiral Stark was a very decent guy, but he did a terrible thing in this story. He would send 56 pages of warnings to Admiral Kimmel in Hawaii. And on almost every single one of them, the next day he would say, actually, I don't think this applies to you. So, and Kimmel would be receiving this avalanche of contradictory information. And this is the reason why Stark was demoted and replaced by Ernie King and becomes head of the landings at Normandy. In Hawaii, oh, uh, in Hawaii, we have uh, uh, <coughs> General Short on the left. This is Lord Mountbatten in the middle. And this is Admiral Kimmel on the right. Uh, so, um, on the one hand, I feel very bad for Kimmel and Short because they really received a public attack. They received death threats. They were held as the reason Pearl Harbor was lost. They were judged guilty. And that's really going too far. But that doesn't excuse what they did do, which is nothing. Uh, so while he's receiving his contradictory warnings from Hawaii, he's also getting materials from his own staff saying, you know, if Japan attacks us, they'll come in from the north with aircraft carriers at dawn. He literally gets a warning saying exactly what will happen. He also gets all these warnings from British intelligence, which he does not pass on to the Army or back to, to Washington. He gets a war warning, which means he's supposed to set way anchor, set sail, and increase surveillance. He does none of those things. It's sort of mysterious what he thought was going on at this point, except that we know he told his lawyers during one of the congressional investigations, I just didn't think they were capable of doing this. Uh, he, he was convinced, he was asked again and again, don't you want to install torpedo nets? And he says, no, we don't need to, because the water is so shallow. And then the English achieve a great victory at a battle called Toronto, where they decimate the Italian fleet in shallow harbor, just like Pearl Harbor. And still, he doesn't pay attention to this. And I just felt that he just was uh, someone who could not really imagine uh, anything but battleships at sea. And that's what he thought was going to happen, and he couldn't imagine anything else. Uh, Short, on the other hand, is a real character. Uh, one of the things he did that's so unbelievable is that he changed the alert numbering system without telling Washington. So in Washington, alert number one was the most you could do, which is prepare for invasion. And alert number three was just prepare for uh, uh, sabotage. And he switched them. So when he got his war warning, he said, I have responded with alert number one, which in Hawaii now meant just prepare for sabotage, the least one, uh, instead of three. So he had switched these numbers. And I'm sure that part of the reason that more wasn't done in response to him was because of that switch. So while one of the fascinating things in this history is learning about the relationship between defense and state. And our State Department 
uh, secretary at this time was Cordell Hall, and here he is flanked by the two Japanese ambassadors, Nomura and Caruso. So Cordell Hall had a terrible speech impediment, uh, and, and, and Franklin Roosevelt had a joke about how I can't stand profanity with a lisp. Uh, but uh, so. Uh, Admiral Nomura was hard of hearing, and his English wasn't so good, and Cordell Hall had a speech impediment, and these were the people negotiating treaty terms with Japan. Uh, and this is part of the reason Caruso was sent over at the last minute to join them. Uh, and this was sort of, this is a very sad story, because on the one hand, Hall is very hawkish. And he did a fantastic thing, if you haven't read them. He immediately after, he has 56, he has over 50 meetings with the Japanese ambassadors in 1941. And at the end of every one, he or his secretary immediately writes down everything everyone said. And it's like eavesdropping on official conversation. It's fantastic material. And, um, uh, so, and he's kind of saying to these poor little ambassadors, you're just a bunch of little Hitlers. You know? And they're saying things like, well, we signed the tripartite treaty because we thought we needed some friends somewhere. You know, they're actually coming, you know, maybe President Roosevelt should think about what a nation should do that doesn't have any re natural resources. And you can see them trying to sort of get through. And they finally do. And at the moment, that one moment, Hull is about to, and they are going to have a diplomatic breakthrough, and they're going to have this sort of normalization of relationships, and then the Japanese go ahead and invade French Indochina, and that torpedoes the whole thing. And it's a real heartbreaking moment in this story. So uh, one of the things that America excelled in code breaking, uh, and we created something called Purple, which uh, decoded, it was invented, it was discovered, it was, the code was broken by a 26-year-old woman named Jean-Viv Grotchen. And I hope that you will know that all of the great code breakers in our military history were women, and they are really ignored in our history. And so I wanted to take a moment to applaud Jean-Viv Grotchen and Miss Aggie, who helped break the military Japanese code. But Jean-Viv Grotchen broke the uh, diplomatic code so while Americans are reading this code going back and forth with diplomats and thinking they know everything and they only know what's going on with the diplomats, uh, Japan sends a guy named Takio Yoshikawa to Honolulu. Now, if you ever want to go into spy craft, you should have your features sort of bland and unmemorable like this. This is the perfect look for a spy because Yoshikawa pretended to be the most incompetent uh, Japanese embassy official in history. He was late for everything. You couldn't trust him. He seemed to be a drinker. He seemed to work erratic hours. But he did this deliberately so that people at the embassy couldn't possibly imagine he actually worked for the Japanese Navy, of which none of this behavior was allowed. And what he did was he was just the greatest tourist Hawaii has ever seen. He took aerial tours over the islands. He went to visit Maui. He took glass bottom boat tours. He went fishing in the harbor. And he did all all these things to send back uh, pieces of data. But one thing that was interesting is that he constantly is talking about how he would go to this tea house up in the hills and overlook Pearl Harbor and do all this spying with a telescope uh, while having tea with the geishas. And so I went to this tea house, and you cannot see any of Pearl Harbor from this tea house, no matter what telescope you have. Now, while there are two uh, very serious warnings about Pearl Harbor. There are only two specific warnings that say the Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. One of them is really fascinating because it comes from the Peruvian ambassador to Japan who tells the American ambassador to Japan, I've heard from multiple sources that if your relationship with Tokyo goes south, they're going to attack Pearl Harbor. And the reason why this is so interesting is that at this time, Peru had a history of sort of uh, their people being the gardeners and the cooks and the nannies of the Japanese. So the only way in January of 41 that this could have happened would be sort of like a cook to tell his friend the nanny or something like that, and it get passed up from the Navy to this embassy. But we don't really, anyway. But uh, when our ambassador sent this over to Washington, it was completely ignored. But the other direct warning is a fascinating story. It comes through this man, Dusan Popov. Popov was a triple agent. He worked simultaneously for the intelligence services of the uh, Nazis, the British, and the Yugoslavs. He himself was Serbian. He was a model for Ian Fleming's James Bond. And he arrives in the FBI offices in Washington in August of 41 to tell J. Edgar Hoover that the Nazis have hired him for a job. And he's to come there and assess American defense preparations. And one third of the questionnaire is about Pearl Harbor. 
But J. Edgar Hoover thinks he's a triple agent. Who can trust anything, he says? And he also knows that um, Popov is having a torrid affair with the married French superstar Simone Simone, who you will remember from the breakout hit Cat People. And so uh, Hoover says he's having an affair with a married woman. Who can trust him? So he throws out the only real warning about Pearl Harbor that we have, one of two. So this is everyone's favorite discovery in this book. This is a uh, November 22nd, 1941 advertisement in the New Yorker magazine. Now remember, we're not at war yet. And you can see it says, the alert, warning, Achtung, we hope you'll never have to spend a long winter's night in an air raid shelter, but we were just thinking it's common sense to be prepared. And it says, you know, you'll need, you'll want things to eat and drink, and you'll want Chicago's favorite game, the Deadly Double. And it shows pictures with 12 and 7 on them. Well, after the attack, the FBI thought this was very suspicious. And they looked into it, and they found out that this game and Monarch Publishing never existed, and that the ad was paid for in person and with, in, with cash with the mechanicals handed over so could not be traced. And it's a mystery that still exists to this day. Is it Pearl Harbor, or is it just a creepy ad? I'm not sure. Now, uh, all of you, I'm sure, with any slight interest in Pearl Harbor, know that it marks the fall of the battleship and the rise of the flat top of the aircraft carrier. But one thing that isn't discussed enough is the revolution in technology with the torpedo. And the reason why the torpedo is so symbolic in this battle is because no matter how powerful your navy is, uh, people with the right torpedoes put, uh, striking at the right place can take you down. And I think it's an amazing lesson to learn in military history. What the Japanese did was they needed to do, uh, launch torpedoes in very shallow water in Pearl Harbor. And they actually came across a method to do it by reading the patents of the United States government. A uh, naval aviator named Bradley Fisk had patented a technique where you come in in a spiraling dive, and then you fly about 12 feet over the water. And then you drop your ordnance about 1,500 feet before the target, and then you immediately climb up to avoid striking the superstructure. And all of this is done with torpedoes that have wooden fins that break off when they hit the water, and that helps them stabilize. And they tried this over and over again, and it finally worked. And one of the aviators said, we knew we were flying too low when we dropped our torpedoes and the water splashed on our wings. So one lesson from Pearl Harbor is if you're flying your torpedo plane and you drop your torpedo and the water splashes on your wings, pull up. You're flying too low. Now, uh, a lot has been written about the midget submarines uh, that entered the harbor and apparently did very little. They were not well designed. Their batteries leaked uh, into the air and made suffocated people. The temperatures rose to 150 degrees. Here's what the insides look like. Uh, they were just horrible. Hor they were basically uh, two men stuck inside a pair of torpedoes. So they were a horrible experience. But there's one mystery about them that still remains to this day. And that is that in the, 60, I, in the 80s, we found one of these torpedoes almost completely intact in Pearl Harbor. And we pulled it up, and we looked inside. And it didn't have any evidence of human beings inside the uh, submarine. So uh, we think, and the only guess is that the two officers made their way to Hawaii and melded into the population and vanished that way. And that's our current theory for what happened. But that's another mystery that still happens. So um, this is a picture of the Akagi, one of the lead aircraft carriers, uh, with a state-of-the-art Japanese zero on it. And uh, so one of the amazing things in this uh, battle, one of the incredible achievements, is that the uh, Japanese spent a year watching the traffic across the Pacific. And they found this one crossing point that was quite a miserable way to cross the Pacific in the winter. And no one used it. So that's the one they took. And they sent an armada of six aircraft carriers, three submarines, two battleships, tankers, uh, destroyers, uh, you know, uh, this giant flotilla went across the Pacific unnoticed except by one ship. And this is another mystery that remains to this day. They came across a Soviet trawler called the Uritsky. And their orders were to sink the Uritsky, which they didn't do. And the Uritsky, we, we assume, reported back to somewhere in our ally, the Soviet Union, that this giant armada was heading towards America. But we don't know anything more about that. So that's one thing we still don't know.
So this shows you why there was so much chaos going on. They came in from every direction all at once. They're coming in from Kahuku Point up at the north, splitting up uh, and coming in to come in from all different directions. And on the way to Pearl Harbor, which is here, uh, they're taking out all of these airfields along the way. So they're destroying, because that's really our only defense are these airfields. And one of the things that was really shocking to me is that uh, there were 43,000 servicemen stationed in Hawaii at this time. Their median age was 19. But the median age at Pearl Harbor and at these bases at dawn on a Sunday was even lower because uh, all of the senior officers lived at homes. So they weren't on the bases and they weren't at the ships. So you could join the Navy at the age of 16 and you could lie and get in at 15. So when you think of Pearl Harbor, don't think of 40-year-old Ben Affleck. Think of Tony Dow from Believe It to Beaver. These were all like teenage kids who this was happening to. Uh, this is where they first spotted land as the as that nearly 400 warplanes approached. Uh, this is the North Shore of Oahu, which is, of course, the, probably the most famous surfing spot in the world now. But at that point, it was this. And of course, they're following in Hawaiian radio, so they're listening to that ukulele music to hone in on the target. And the very first victim was someone I don't think has been talked about enough. Uh, in the north end of Oahu is a little tiny airport called John, then John Rogers, now it's called Honolulu City Airport. And uh, if you had a pilot's license, you could go there and rent little planes. So a group of California National Guardsmen who had been stationed in Hawaii for a year and were supposed to go home the next day, December 8th, decided to take an aloha aerial tour of Hawaii to say goodbye. So they went to the little airport and they rented these little uh, balsam and canvas planes that were on tandems and Piper Cubs. And they were up in the air sightseeing when they met Japanese fighters and were taken down. And they became the first American victims of World War II. <clears throat> uh, this is Hickam. And these are, of course, taken from Japanese planes. And this is a beautiful place called Kaneohe, which is a little bit away. This is one of those uh, air, uh, airfields that they took out on their way to Pearl Harbor. And Kaneohe has an incredible story. The chief ordnance man was a man named John Finn. And when John Finn saw all of his planes on fire, he became enraged. And he took a machine gun out of one of the planes on fire with live ammo. And he set it up on a metal mount in the middle of the apron, and he just kept firing at incoming dive bombers and zero fighters. Uh, by the end of the attack, he was bleeding from 29 wounds, including his scalp had been gashed open, so blood is pouring down his face. And he's still fighting and fighting. And he said, it just wasn't my day to die. And he wins the Medal of Honor. But my, but my uh, heart really broke for John Finn. He was asked about what he thought of the movie, the Ben Affleck movie, Pearl Harbor. And he said, those actresses are very pretty. So I love that uh, uh, <laughs> measured response. Here's Mr. Finn. Now, this is the very first beginning of the strike. And this is, of course, a famous picture you've probably seen many times. But if you see this again, no point, note that you can see uh, Japanese torpedo planes pulling up after dropping this torpedo that's striking there. And you can see, actually, the wake of the torpedo here. And this is, of course, the famous picture. And again, you can see the torpedo wake here. Um, and this is Hickam on fire in the back. So as I told you, the only picture we have, uh, uh, we use that cover picture so you could see what happened on Arizona. This is one of the only pictures we have of the strike on Arizona. Uh, and a doctor aboard the hospital ship Solis had gotten a movie camera for pic uh, Christmas. And he was testing it out and just happened to shoot some film. So the only Arizona strikes we have are stills from his film in color. This is hand tinting, but I love this picture because you can see you know, the size of the rescue boats are these tiny things, and they're really needing to try and rescue off of a city. There are 11 to 15,000 on each one of these ships.
And this is something that was very difficult to find because we think that just like after 9-11, the pictures of people jumping from the towers were sort of scrubbed from public view, I think this was a kind of thing was scrubbed. Um, uh, the great horror at Pearl Harbor was that because all of these ships had their fuel tanks full, when they were uh, bombed and torpedoed, all of that fuel went into the harbor and it created an oil slick six inches high. And the oil slick immediately was set on fire and the boys jumping off their sinking ships would jump into this oil and be turned into matchsticks. So the great majority of deaths at Pearl Harbor are from burns. And because the, between that and the fact that almost no one was wearing dog tags is the reason why we still have almost 500 unidentified buried at Punchbowl. This is the uh, Oklahoma overturned. The rescue effort from that story is amazing because they tried all these different things and each one killed people until they finally figured out the right way to do it. And here is, uh, I hope that one day I will be able to write something in two drafts as good as Franklin Roosevelt. Here is the, his famous speech. And you'll see that he, he, this, he's dictating this to his secretary and then making one revision, and that's it. And you'll see he changed a date which will live in world history to a date which will live in infamy. And of course, here is uh, Mr. Roosevelt. He is, he is balancing on his braces to give this speech standing up. So every time he's standing up, it must have been just excruciating. I don't know how he did it. Says he's wearing braces to keep his useless legs straight and balancing on his hips to appear to stand. Uh, one of the most one of the wonderful stories in the, all of this happens to a man named Doris Miller, who is a mess attendant on the West Virginia. Uh, black people could not join the Navy, but they could work for the Navy in these sort of janitorial type positions. And, uh, and when the attack began, an officer of the West Virginia asked uh, Doris Miller if he would like to hand him the ammunition while he fired the gun at the Japanese. And Mr. Miller said, no, sir, I would like to fire that gun over there at the Japanese. And he's credited with at least taking down one plane. And here he is being awarded the Navy star by Chester Nimitz. But he would die in the Tarawa battle a couple of years later. And many people will be upset that he got the star instead of the Medal of Honor because he was black. And this will so sort of stick in the craw that he will become a civil rights martyr. And he will directly lead to uh, Truman integrating the services. So he will become a civil rights hero and his valor on the West Virginia. Now, one of the great unsung heroes of this story are the men and women of the United States Navy salvage teams. And what the miracle they have is that in merely two years of 97 ships in the harbor uh, that, that morning, they will restore all but three of them and get them back in working order. And they will participate in uh, the attacks against the Japanese across the Pacific Theater. And one, West Virginia, will be sunk at Pearl Harbor and then will appear in Tokyo Bay at the signing of the surrender document. So here is this fantastic array. I say it's just like Gulliver, Ries, uh, Gulliver and the Lilliputians, this fantastic array riding the Oklahoma. And here are Navy frogmen. If anyone here knows what this helmet is, I'd like to know more about it. Uh, anyway, I thought it was very interesting, this helmet. And do you remember the book on the cover, uh, on the cover of the book, the ship on the cover? This is it one year later. This is the Shaw that you saw exploding on the cover. And here it is, restored and back in service. Thank you. Uh, here is Pearl Harbor today. It's a fantastic port. I got to travel all over the place. Uh, and it's quite wonderful because two or three of the buildings are still there. And you can see uh, 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 strafer marks in the, in the walls. They've left it uh, there to, as a memorial. And of course, uh, because it was filled with oil, it's still leaking oil to this day. So when you go, it's sort of like a living thing. And uh, it's being taken over by coral. And we know that it's filled with human teeth because of that's what remains in the water. So before I go, I'd like to give two uh, more stories. Uh, the first one is, we really came to the, I really came to the conclusion that there was a tremendous amount of undiagnosed PTSD among the greatest generation. Because what, what happened was uh, we would constantly be getting in touch with the children of survivors. I belong to the Pearl, 
sons and daughters of Pearl Harbor Survivors Association. And we would get in touch with these people and say, we're really looking for stories that no one's ever heard before. And they would say, my dad or my mom died without telling us a thing. And they, were trying, they didn't want to relive it. They didn't want to subject their children to the horror of what they'd been through. And when you look at the oral history archives, one fascinating research development is that you can find nothing about World War II from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And then starting around the 90s and the aughts, this burst appears. And now it's fading away, because now they're all in their 90s. And I just want to tell one story about that. It's a man named Sterling Kale. And Mr. Kale uh, was in charge of collecting the dead from the Arizona. And he went onto it, and he realizes that there's all this dust swirling around him. And he can't figure out what it is. And then he realizes it's human beings that have been incinerated. So he tries collecting the dust in his bag. And it's not something you can do. And he fails at it. And six years later, he's at the beach with his new family. And he has a six-year-old little, uh, two-year-old little boy. And a rogue wave washes up and pulls the little boy into the water. And Mr. Kale goes running to save his son. And the water hits his feet, and he's paralyzed. He was so traumatized by the last time he was in the water on December 7th and what he went through that he can no longer swim or go in water at all, and he cannot save his child. And thankfully, the family had adopted as a pet a canine core, German Shepherd, and the Shepherd ran into the water and saved the little boy. But that was the last time Mr. Kale could even walk by a beach without getting nauseated. He couldn't even walk by a beach after that. But there's one awfully sweet story I'd like to end with. Uh, after, after spending five years on this and seeing the worst thing human beings can do, it was sort of incredible to find one story about the best. And this is a man named <clears throat> Zenji Abi who is one of the lead dive bomber pilots in the attack against Pearl Harbor. And after the war ended, Abe found out that the Japanese had not declared war before attacking. And he thought this was a shameful violation of the spirit of war, which they had ascribed to. And filled with sort of shame and guilt, he spent almost 10 years crossing Japan, looking for aviators who had participated in the attack to get them to sign a letter of apology. And he got hundreds of signatures onto this letter. And he shows up in Atlanta at the home of one of the officers of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association. And in his halting English, he presents this letter. And the American says, you can shove that letter up your ass, and sh slams the door in his face. Uh, but Mr. Abe will not be deterred. He starts getting a group of his fellow Japanese aviators to regularly appear at the Survivor Association reunions on December 7th. And they are really not wanted. And they're sort of ignored. But finally, they have a breakthrough with a Marine named Richard Fisk. Now, Mr. Fisk had not only survived Sir Pearl Harbor. Because he was a Marine, he also survived what he called 36 days of Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Iwo Jima. And those of you who know who World War history, you know how gruesome and horrible that battle was. Richard Fisk was so damaged by his World War II experience that he could not even look at an ad for sushi without getting sick. He was repulsed by anything having to do with Japan. But for some reason, these little old Japanese men showing up and asking to be forgiven sort of broke through to him. And at one point, he just leaned over and started hugging them. He couldn't even talk. And he and Abe developed a friendship where Abe would finance Fisk going to the Arizona Memorial once a month and laying down a white and red rose and then playing taps in Japanese and American versions. And Fisk eventually went to uh, Japan, where he received an award from Emperor Akihito for his help in uh, friendship with Japan and America. And at his last reunion, a Japanese man came up to him and grabbed his hands and burst into tears and apologized. And Fisk said, uh, don't apologize. We were soldiers doing our duty. And besides, my, uh, my girl married a Japanese boy, so what can I do? So, I wanted to tell you that one nice story, and also to tell you that I think that there is a paradox with Pearl Harbor in that if we look at what happened at Pearl Harbor, it's a historic moment. But if we look at how the United States reacted to Pearl Harbor, that is even more historic. That after Pearl Harbor, we created the biggest military the world has ever seen. We created an enormous intelligence agencies. We created the United Nations. That's why Cordell Hall won his Nobel Peace Prize for helping to begin the United Nations, so people could amicably settle their differences. And we created a Pax Americana, 
which kept World War III from happening for 70 years. And while many of those things are double-edged swords, the fact that we have not had World War III for 70 years is an incredible legacy of Pearl Harbor. And for your time, I thank you kindly. So anyone who has a question, I think we have microphones. Where are those microphones? OK, there's one. Oh, they're on stands at each end. So if anyone has a question, or you can raise your hand and yell. But I think they want you on the microphone so they can put you on the TV. You made an old man cry, Richard Fisk. Damn it, hell. Yes. Um, in your book, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Does this thing work? OK. Um, in your book, you mention how so many Americans, how many of us love Japan, and yet it was so difficult to cut so that was it, it was such a beautiful place. It was difficult for a lot of Americans to comprehend this attack, not just because of that, but for a whole host of reasons. I still have never seen, and I'm not saying about your book, but anything I've ever read explaining the brutality of members of the Japanese armed forces. And I'm talking about China, you right. know, as, and, you know, and all of the Pacific Island right. battles. What you think? Well, uh, just like the uh, man, many American commanders were blinded by racism and couldn't imagine the Japanese were capable of doing such a thing, I think the Japanese were blinded by racism when it came to other Asians. There's this famous tourist attraction outside Kyoto called the Ear Mound, because when uh, Japan colonized Korea and brought back human souvenirs, they buried it in this mound. And it was different body parts. It wasn't just ears, so, but it's called the Ear Mound. And that's sort of the, the, the what a military historian had the theory that because they had this, they turned this Bushido idea into that everyone was just uh, meat. You know, all, all the other human beings were just meat. And if you were captured a prisoner uh, and you didn't kill yourself, you were meat. So they just saw uh, other people as inferior to them, just the way we saw them as inferior to us. And, that, and other than that, it's an inexplicable. It's as inexplicable as why MacArthur sat there for eight hours doing nothing. Yes. You talked about the negotiations that the prime minister before Tojo yeah. was doing. Could I? And people were figuring those were kind of uh, trying to buy time. And also there were negotiations right before Pearl Harbor attack itself. In your research, were the Japanese just basically trying to buy time? Or did they actually seriously hope for peace? No, they were seriously hoping for peace. In fact, you can, I, I, the way I did this was, in the book was to present you with the documents and with the behind the scenes memoirs and uh, autobiographies so that you can see this actually playing out in real time. What you'll see is that the Japanese leadership is constantly swinging back and forth on this issue, that many of them think it is foolish to go to war with the United States. They even have spies in New York compiling manufacturing and natural resource statistics to prove how foolish it is to do. And you can see them at uh, any moment you think, this isn't going to happen. It's, all, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like I, I faked it, but it, it's all true. At any moment you think, oh, Pearl Harbor's not going to happen. Look, they're all going away from it. And they just swing back and forth. And this was one of the times when even Tojo said that he was willing to consider a, a, a contract. If, they could fi if the United States could have figured out how to give them time to withdraw from China at a way that would save face and could treat them as somewhat equals at the bargaining table, we would have had that treaty. But no one could do that. Yes, sir. Um, prior to Pearl Harbor, the United States moved its fleet from San Diego. Um, I'm curious, well, nowadays, if you were to, the US government were to move a major uh, military force around the world, it's always taken as a very strong diplomatic statement of displeasure, usually. So what was the role of this decision to move uh, the fleet from San Diego? Well, and um, <laughs> I guess that's the main uh, because it seems as though it's an aggressive statement to Japan. Yes, and Roosevelt intended it that way. And he really felt that by basing such so many of our Navy in Hawaii, 
he was telling, warning the Japanese, you better cut it out or we're going to go over and do that. But we have a fantastic quote from Yamamoto on how it didn't work, uh, how, how he said, you know, actually the fleet is so close, we can do something to it too. Uh, I can't remember the exact words, but it's something like that. And both Kimmel and his predecessor, Richardson, complained bitterly against FDR doing that. And Richardson lost his job because of the way he handled that argument. Yes, sir. Uh, uh a Japanese sailor that I met, uh, who was a sailor during World War II, he said that many of the Japanese pilots thought that there was a 30-minute warning given to the Americans before they hit the attack. Is that true? They were supposed to give that warning, but there was one stinker in the Japanese cable office, a colonel by the name of Morio Tamura, and he delayed the cable going from Roosevelt to Emperor Hirohito and he turned around and delayed the 14-part message uh, announcing the end of negotiations going from Tokyo to Washington. So it shows you, you know, one little stinker can really mess up the whole thing. And he's really responsible for the day of infamy. If either of those things had gone through on a timely basis, they would have declared war before the attack. And we might have gotten that message to Hirohito in time to stop things. It was just late by 12 hours, which is about how much he delayed it. Yes. I was wondering what effect uh, the uh, relations between the United States and Japan were affected by uh, uh, Roosevelt wanting to move against Germany um, uh, and uh, to do something about that. Did right. that affect anything? Well, one of the things we keep forgetting, because we have such an incredible military today, is that at this moment in time, the United States military was 14th in size in the world. We were behind Sweden. Our, Army main weapon was a 1903 Springfield rifle. Their helmets were pie plate helmets from uh, you know, 30 years before. They had liners that took half an hour to lace. Our entire Air Force was something like 700 working planes around the world. And so we were really not in any position to take on Germany at that time. And you see Roosevelt fretting over and over and again about having the wrong war in the wrong ocean at the wrong time. And in fact, when uh, he receives that memo from the Navy and the Army saying, oh no, we're not more powerful than the Japanese, you've got to play for time. You see him doing everything to stop the move to war. He tries to reinstall a, what he calls a modus vivendi, a sort of cooling off period. And that's when he even writes to Hirohito over the backs of his and, his, and Hirohito's State Department. Yes. To what extent did the uh, Japanese leadership consider alternatively attacking the Soviet Union instead of the U.S., and were among those uh, who uh, were skeptical of attacking the U.S., were those the ones who were most interested in attacking the Soviet Union, or were there others? Well, this was a, um, there, there is actually something called the right persimmon strategy that they were arguing about, which was they thought that they could easily take on the Soviet Union, so that was the right persimmon strategy, or they should go into the south and take on that territory I showed you that was the unripe persimmon strategy. So this all changed dramatically when the Nazis invaded. Before, the Nazi, before Barbarossa and the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, their Japanese foreign minister had achieved an incredible diplomatic achievement by signing the tripartite agreement with Germany and Italy, and at the same time signing a non-aggression treatment with the Soviet Union. And so he was sitting on top of the world. And then that happened, and it upended anything, everything, because they realized the uh, Nazis could just as easily do that to them. Uh, and, and it sort of threw them into chaos. So then there was the question of uh, he wanted to attack the Soviets and go take over this territory at the same time. And that's when Hirohito thought he was crazy and got rid of him. Uh, and, and then there was this fighting going on. Well, what should we do about the Soviets? And there's a great story with part of the downfall of the Koenige government in that there was a Soviet spy ring in Tokyo operating at that time. And we believe that that spy ring was able to tell uh, uh, Stalin that the Japanese were not going to attack so he could pull troops out of Vladivostok and send them to the front in Stalingrad. Yes. On Turner Classic Movies tonight at 8 o'clock is Torah, Torah, Torah. Is it worth two hours and 45 minutes of my time, or should I watch Hairspray on another <laughs> channel? Well, well, let me say that if you want to get a picture of how the torpedoes and the bombs actually look, the Ben Affleck movie is good for that. 
if you want to know details about the Soviet, I mean, excuse me, the Japanese military, Tora 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 is good for that. But I have to warn you about something. And this is what internet history is doing to us today. If you look online, you will see uh, we have awakened a sleeping dragon attributed to Yamamoto. Right. Thousands and thousands of times. So of course, I put this beautiful quote in my book, because who wouldn't? And then when I was doing my citations, I had to track down, exactly when did he say this? It took me three days, nonstop research, to find out it had been made up for the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. And he said something a little bit like that, but he didn't say, we have awakened the sleeping dragon. So I got a little bee in my bonnet about that movie. But it's pretty good if you want to know about it. OK, we'll watch it. Thank you. Oh. Yes, sir. I understand that uh, Prime Minister Abe is finally representing Japan and apologizing for 75 years after the fact, mm -hmm. or, or maybe we weasel wording it or something. But well, why do you think is, what, what is it about the Japanese character that has taken this long? Well, we actually found a scholar who had gone through the uh, Arizona visitor comic cards and pulled out all the ones from Japan. And almost every single one of them said, you know, in your movie about Pearl Harbor, you should mention Hiroshima and Nagasaki, too. Because they didn't realize that if we mentioned Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it would be how fantastic it was to bomb the shit out of these people with these atomic weapons if you put that in light of Pearl Harbor. So uh, for 70 years, we've been at loggerheads with Japan over them feeling we should apologize for Hiroshima and we feeling they should apologize for Pearl Harbor. So we had Obama was, I think he was the first president, to appear at Hiroshima. He didn't really apologize. He just said, it's a tragedy. And that's what I think Abe will be doing. But it's still a breakthrough at these loggerheads for a, a, an argument that's been going on an awfully long time. And if you go to Japan and you go to the Hiroshima Memorial, you'll see a movie about how beautiful little Japanese children are playing out in the sunflower fields. And suddenly, for no reason, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on them. So they have a lot to go with their own education on this story. OK, thank you so very much. Oh. Let, let me explain one thing. There's a little bit of a competitive issue going on here. When I was at FDR Library, which is a much less significant library than this one, uh, uh, we sold out the books. So National is hoping to beat FDR Library. So I hope you'll buy them and help support your home team. And also, I'm about to hit the bestseller list. So any, you might be the one that puts me onto the list. So I would appreciate that, too. Thank you all very much. What is the, uh, the next? 2 o'clock. What time is it now? <laughs>